We're back on that adventure of the Bible. And we're looking at rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we're going through the Bible and we're looking at how to rightly divide. And we've made it to the days of Noah. Now you get over to Genesis 6 and you see that the devil has really gotten a hold of man. And we talked about how last time people call this certain dispensation that Noah would be in, they would call it the dispensation of conscience. And by Genesis 6, you see that the devil's got in and he's completely defiled everybody's conscience. I mean, their conscience is seared with a hot iron just like a lot of people's conscious is now you know under under the dispensation of innocence he wanted to take away their innocence so that's what he did he got adam and eve all messed up took away their innocence now under the dispensation of of conscience he's defiling their conscience and you get down to Genesis 6, 5, and it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And then you get down to 6, 8, and it talks about Noah. It says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there's always been grace. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. Man is a sinner. He inherited it, inherited it from Adam. Noah was a sinner, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah wasn't sinless, but he walked with God, and he found grace. Grace, God giving you something that you don't deserve. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Without grace, nobody would have had a shot at all, you see. So he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and it says in verse 9, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So the devil had gotten in there and during this dispensation of conscience and he had completely defiled their conscience, corrupted them. And I call this the days of Noah because that's what the Lord calls it in Matthew 24, 37. And he compares it to the tribulation time period. He says, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So that's why I titled it that, the days of Noah. So Noah's a just man, and he had his own righteousness. Look at this. This is a key for rightly dividing here. Look at Ezekiel 14. Ezekiel 14 and verse 14. He says, Though these three, three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. Then look down at verse 20. He says it again. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. You see? They had their own righteousness. Now, me and you, today, this is a rightly dividing key here. We don't have our own righteousness. Look at what Romans 3.10 says. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God, in verse 11. And in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. You see, there's a difference there. Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his house, Hebrews 11.7. The Lord has Noah build an ark, and he gets Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives in that ark and his wife in that ark so there's eight of them that gets on the ark and everybody else perishes in the flood of the ungodly 
You see, he prepared an ark for the saving of his house. And we lay the foundations and build the word in our families for the saving of our house. He laid the foundation of the ark. He built the ark. We lay the foundation of the word in the heart of our families to save our house. Acts 16.31. In Acts 16.31, Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. He said that to the Philippian jailer. So while Noah was building an ark for the saving of his house, me and you are building a foundation of a, a scriptural-based home for the saving of our house. You know, his was more about physical things. Ours is spiritual things. You know, he tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 9-1. And I told you this is a big thing because in Genesis 9-1 it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. He said that to Adam as well. Now, Adam was the first man. If Adam didn't do this, there wouldn't have been any more people. If Noah didn't do this, when he got off the ark, you know, all them guys would have died. They would have been extinct. They had to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, you got guys today who aren't rightly dividing, and they're using these verses to say that you just got to have as many kids as you can. Just keep having them and having them and having them. But that's not rightly dividing. I can't go back here and use these verses about that and put that on me today. I can't use that to say you shouldn't have any form of birth control whatsoever. You know, Paul doesn't even get married. And Paul says it'd be better if you if you didn't burn in your lust. It'd be better if you just stayed single so that you could serve the Lord even more. So if you don't even have to get married, you know, you don't have to have children. Have to have a bunch of children. You know, that's between you, your wife, and God. You know, and in some situations... Maybe the situations you, you are in, you know your life. You know what the Lord is leading you to do. Maybe it's not the wisest decision to keep on having more kids and bringing them into the certain situation that you're in. You now I, I look at it balanced. You know, I'm not I'm not for this thing that says, well, we shouldn't have kids because the world is so bad. I'm not for that. But then I'm not for somebody coming and saying, well. You should just keep having kid after kid after kid because you're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. No, it's different for every situation. And I can't use these verses and, and hammer them onto somebody, hammer them into somebody's head, beat them in the face with it to get them to have more and more children, you see. That's between that married couple and the Lord about how many kids they're going to have. But he tells Noah to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. You know what else he tells them under this uh, Noahic covenant here? He says, And the fear of you, this is Genesis 9, 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon that, all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, and to your hands are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So, and he says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So, you've got here that they're no longer vegetarians. Remember how last time I told you Adam and Eve, all them, that have been vegetarians, the animals vegetarians. But here in Genesis 3 and 4, he says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. So already here you got a huge difference. Before the flood, they weren't eating meat. After the flood, they are eating meat. And then today, Paul says to Timothy, he says, you know, we can eat all, every creature of God and nothing to be refused if it can be received with thanksgiving. And watch out for people that saying, you can't eat that certain type of meat because Paul said that's a doctrine of a devil for them to say that. I don't have to be a vegetarian. You can eat meat, you see. 
Now, before the flood, they didn't. And then even under the law, there is God gives you some certain types that you can eat. But today, it's even different than that because every creature of God, nothing to be refused. So you got to go through and you got to rightly divide. God never changes, but his instructions to men change. How he deals with men changes. I mean, this is already just in, we're in chapter nine and we've already seen so many changes of how he's dealing with man. And then you get down to verse four and five. He's talking about capital punishment where he says, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So capital punishment is instituted here. And that's why back in uh, Genesis 4, Cain wasn't killed for killing Abel. Capital punishment hadn't been instituted yet. And capital punishment goes all the way up. Uh, to today, you know, Paul talks about it in Romans 13. Uh, Paul taught, said in the book of Acts, he said, if I've, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. You know, capital punishment is, is still for today. And that's why, you know, you can't just, you can't slice it into perfect cuts throughout the Bible and say, well, this dispensation just completely ends here. Or this covenant completely ends here because, you know, some stuff, some of the stuff overlaps. Some of it doesn't. You know, that's why you got to study to show yourself approved. But this, uh, and what you have here in uh, Genesis 9, this puts you in what most people call the dispensation of human government. That's what it's mostly called. And now we get into a big one. And this one may seem kind of tedious and uh, you may get bored with it. Now me, I think it's super interesting. I don't know how you feel about it, but if you'll just bear through it, I know you might think it's boring, but if you just bear through this and get this down, this will help you so much. Just a little amount of time getting some of this stuff down will help you so much through the Bible. This is big on rightly dividing here. In 1 Corinthians 10.32, you got these three people groups. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 10.32, write down that verse, memorize this verse, remember this verse. It says in 1 Corinthians 10.32, Give none offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. So three people groups, Jews, Gentiles, church of God. A great chunk of the scriptures can be understood by realizing the difference between the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God. Now, obviously, the Jews are the Jews. The Gentiles are those who aren't Jews. That's not too hard. And then you got the church of God, which is made up of those who may be Jew or Gentile physically. But since they are saved, they are spiritually neither Jew nor Gentile. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So in Christ, I'm neither Jew nor Gentile. In Christ, I'm not Gentile. But physically, I am whatever I am. I'm, uh, I'm Gentile. But a big chunk of your Bible can be understood by realizing who the Jews are and rightly dividing the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel, you see. But let's go back. Let's talk about this. In Genesis 6 through 9, what we just looked at, it's all Gentiles. Like Noah and all them, that's Gentiles. There are no Jews yet in Genesis 6 through 9. During this time, you had the days of Noah. The Gentiles are wicked. And God flooded out the whole world because uh, the Gentiles made a mess of things. They didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. As he talks about in Romans 1, he's giving you that history of the Gentiles. And they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. And they got to messing around with the sons of God. 
The thoughts and their imaginations of the heart was on the evil continually, so he floods everything out. Then shortly after the flood, you see in Genesis 11, everybody's getting together without God, and they build the Tower of Babel, and that's a mess. So they're messing things up yet again, and they're trying to get in contact with them sons of God again, most likely. So God has to come down and confound their language, forcing them to spread out. But then also in Genesis 11, you have a guy named Abram that shows up. Now, this is a key. If you don't know who Abram is, you need to write down Abram. And you need to find out who he is. Now, this guy, Abram, he marries his half-sister, Sarai. Now, this is a rightly dividing key here. You can't go back here to Genesis 11 and teach that it's okay to marry your sister. Just because Abram married Sarai, his half-sister. This was a time before God said, you know, marrying your sister is not right. He doesn't actually command it until you get under the law of Moses that you can't marry your close kin like that. In Leviticus 18.9, it says, The nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shall, thou shalt not uncover. So it gets to a time... Where God says, hey, you can't do this anymore, you see. And there's no hint that he ever is okay with that ever again. So you don't marry your, you can't marry your sister. That's not good. So you can't go back here and look at Abram's situation and say, well, he married his half-sister. I'm going to marry my sister. No, you can't do that. That wouldn't be rightly dividing. But you got this guy, Abram, and in Genesis 12, the Lord calls out Abram, the Hebrew, as it calls him in Genesis 14, 13. This is a key. Write it down. Abram, the Hebrew, underline Hebrew, highlight it or whatever. Because I'm going to tell you why they're called Hebrews. They're called Hebrews because they came from a guy named Heber. Now, Listen real close. Look at Luke 3, 34 through 36. Luke 3, 34 through 36. It says, which was the son of Jacob. Now this is giving you the genealogy of Jesus going backwards. Which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, who was Abram. Abraham is Abram. Which was the son of, so it says, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Terah, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Saruk, which was the son of Ragu, sounds like that spaghetti sauce, which was the son of Phelek, which was the son of Heber. So you see that? Which was the son of Heber. That's where you get Hebrews. So that's why Abraham is called Abraham the Hebrew. So that's where all the, and you got the book of Hebrews. Now me, when I found that out, that just, that just unlocked something for me in my brain. To me, that's big, finding out something like that. For you, that may not be so enlightening, but when I found out why they were called Hebrews was because they came from a guy named Heber. Now it's, it's spelled Eber in Genesis, E-B-E-R, but in Luke, it's spelled H-E-B-E-R. Hebrew, Heber. They're called Hebrews because they came from Heber. So if that don't unlock something for you, write it down anyway. Maybe when you get further along in this, it'll really just unlock something for you in your brain because it does for me. But then you keep reading on and you look, you see Luke 3.36. It said in 35, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Selah, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sim, which was the son of Noe, which was the son of Lamech. Now, Noe, N-O-E, that's Noah. And Sim, S-E-M, is Shem, Noah's son. So Abraham came from Shem. Now, Noah had three sons, remember, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The Europeans come from Japheth, Africans from Ham, the Hebrews came from Shem. So you got Shem called Sim, 
in Luke 3.36. So Abram is in the line of Shem or Sim. Heber, where you get the word Hebrew, is the grandson of Shem, one of Noah's boys. And this is where you get anti-Semitic. S-E-M, anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic people, you hear that word all the time today. And anti-Semitic people are those who are hostile, prejudiced, racist, or whatever towards the Jewish people. Anti-Semitic. That when I found that out, when I heard that years back, that it's called anti-Semitic because of Sim or Shem, that just unlocks something else in my brain. I love finding out why we call them Hebrews, why we call it anti-Semitic. But that's where that comes from. So you got Abram, the guy that God is going to use to call out or to, to, to formulate the nation of Israel is a guy named Abraham. He for, in, in, at first you got where he's formulating the nation of Israel over there with Abraham in the, in the book of Genesis. The Lord is calling out Abram because he's done with dealing with Gentiles as individuals. Now he's going to start dealing with nations in Genesis chapter 12, especially a nation that will come from Abraham. So he's calling, he's, he's, he's going to formulate it here. Genesis 12, Abraham will be the first Jew. Abraham's the first Jew. Think about that. Before him, it's Gentiles. Now God's doing something new here. He's going to start dealing with a nation, starting with Abraham. It says in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. See, he's wanting to make a great nation. Not dealing with individuals so much, just individuals so much no more. He's still going to deal with individuals, but now he's dealing with nations. He says, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You hear that? He's going to bless them that bless Abraham, and curse them that curse him. This is why you always hear Christians and preachers declaring we should support is be in support of Israel. He said he's going to bless them that bless them and curse them that curse them. You get over to Genesis 13. He's going through it again. Genesis 13, 14 through 16. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever see it's forever he's going to give them this land forever and i will make thy seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust of the earth then shall thy seed also be numbered you see that imagine going to the beach and picking up a handful of sand you know how you can pick up a handful of sand and slowly let it drop out the 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 that hole at the side of your fist really slowly. And imagine you, you did that with every grain of sand on the planet. How long that would take you and how many grains of sand would pass through that hole. That's how many children God's going to give Abraham throughout eternity. It's going to be innumerable. You know that song that the little kids sing, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. He's got many sons all, that he's had all, that's come from Abraham already. And it's going to go on out through all eternity. It says in Genesis 13, 17, Arise, walk through the land and the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. He's given him a land, and he's given him a seed. Then you get over to Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, 5, it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars like count the stars. Like a bank teller and tell the stars. If thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So he tells Abraham, Go out from your tent there and look up. And all them stars out there, you can't count all them stars. That's how many 
kids you're going to have. That's how many people is going to come from you. You know, a lot of smart guys out there, they say there's 200 billion trillion stars. That's how Abraham's seed's going to be. And in Genesis 15, 6 through 7, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Now here's another rightly dividing key. Abraham gets righteousness for believing, about, believing God about his seed. We get righteousness by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Abraham didn't go out there and say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for my sins, he was buried and resurrected. He didn't know that. He didn't know about the Lord Je that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross for our sins and be buried and resurrected. But he believed God about his seed, which was a wild thing to believe because he was already old at this point. So for ha him to have even a, a son in his old age with his wife that's old too, that would have been an unbelievable thing to believe, but yet he believed it. Then you get to Genesis 16. Abraham makes a mess of things because him and his wife, Sarai, they, they just can't wait on the Lord to get that, that promised son. So Sarai is barren. That means she can't have no kids. And she's in such a rush to have a child that she wants Abraham to go in into Hagar, her handmaid, and have a son. So he goes into Hagar, and Hagar becomes his wife. Now here's another rightly dividing key. God was never okay with Polygamy. Polygamy, that's getting you more than one woman at once. Marrying more than one woman. He was never okay with it, but he allowed it in the Old Testament. And I've heard different reasons about why he allowed it. And I've, I've never heard a, a perfect great answer on that. If you got great answers on that, I'd love to hear it. But he allowed it in the Old Testament. It was never what he wanted, but he allowed it. You know, Abraham, David, Solomon, Jacob, all them guys, they had many wives. Uh, but today, you know, Paul uses the characteristic of a man being the husband of one wife, you know, as an ideal qualification for a pastor. You know, he says in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now, just because these are qualifications for a pastor doesn't mean that each and every one of us as Christians shouldn't strive for these qualifications to be a part of our life and testimony. You know, it'd be good if you uh, were blameless. It'd be good if you were vigilant. It'd be good if you were sober. It'd be good if you were of good behavior, given hospitality, apt to teach. It would be good if you were the husband of one wife. And the husband of one wife there, that's not talking about somebody that got married and then divorced and then married again and you say well that's well they they're not the husband of one wife if a man's been divorced and got married again he only has one wife he may have not had just one wife in his and throughout his entire life but he if he's been divorced and he's married to this other woman now he just has one wife you know think about you know somebody that you know picture in your mind right now somebody that you know that's been divorced and then married again when you look at him do you say well that guy he's got two wives he's not the husband of one wife no you don't do that that guy's got one wife he's been divorced husband and one wife is talking about somebody that's got one wife it's one wife at a time and, and Obviously, I'm not. I'm not saying divorce is good or nothing, but I'm. I'm just telling you here. And Paul says, you know, you need to be the husband of one wife. You know, it's we don't need to be polygamists. And you, you can't. You shouldn't go back to the Old Testament and use Abraham, David, Solomon, and Jacob to say, well, they had multiple wives, so we can have multiple wives. No, Paul says. Husband of one wife is the a, is a best, is what you need to do. And there's been, been pastors even around here where I live that I've heard of in the past that used the story of like Abraham and Sarah or David in his situation to teach it's okay for a man to have multiple wives. And so this fake pastor just took him another wife or two. 
But Abraham going into Hagar was a big mistake. Not only was this a failure in waiting on God, but from this relationship come Ishmael. And you know, from Ishmael, you got the Muslim, Abrabs, Islam, and stuff. But Genesis 17, the Lord gives Abraham the sign of circumcision. And this may seem like an odd topic to talk about, but circumcision is a big topic in the Bible. The circumcision, you, re you read that phrase, the circumcision, that's talking about the Jews in the Bible. You know, you're reading through Romans and you see that where it talks about the circumcision and the uncircumcision. The circumcision is the Jews. The uncircumcision is the Gentiles. It's getting circumcised, that's a big thing for the Jews. Even in the New Testament, they were trying to make that, the Jews were trying to make that uh, a requirement for salvation. You got to believe, they, they thought you got to believe on Jesus Christ and be circumcised, some of them. And Paul was coming back and saying, no, circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. It ain't about whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It's have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's water baptism. They're saying you got to get water baptized and believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. But but back then, during the book of Acts and stuff, when Paul was, was coming through, everybody was trying to tell him, you know, it's about circumcision. you got to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved and all that. But, it's, uh, it, see, this is a rightly dividing key here. Back then, with this covenant with Abraham, you had to get circumcised. God wanted all of them to be circumcised, to be a part of this Abrahamic covenant. If you weren't circumcised, you couldn't be a part of it. Now, you're at liberty to be circumcised if you want to. Circum don't circumcise if you don't want to. And I've even, just in the past couple of years, I've heard about young couples getting in fights about with their husband they or wife. They can't agree on if they're going to circumcise their son or not circumcise their son. And it's it, it doesn't matter either way. Now, when it comes to all the medical stuff that goes along with it i'm not a doctor so so i don't know but when it comes to your spiritual life you're not wicked if you don't get circumcised and you're not wicked if you do get circumcised you know as long as you're not saying you got to be saved to be saved you got to get circumcised you're good you know that's your own conviction there but look at genesis 17 and let's talk about this circumcision stuff Genesis 17, 1, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk, that, walk before me and be thou perfect. So even at 99 years old, Abraham still hasn't had the promised son yet. And this is what shows Abraham's faith is so great. He's still continuing to believe the Lord, even though it's shaky at times, just like with me and you, He deep down he believes the Lord is going to, have this come to pass and it says in verse 2 and i will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly and abram fell on his face and god talked with him saying as for me behold my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations he, the, his god has the abrahamic covenant with abraham and he, he's telling him, under this covenant, he's a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. So this is where he actually is, starts being called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. As Abraham, that name means high father. That's not a good name for him because he was a humble guy. The Lord says, you're Abraham. That, that's the, that means the father of many nations. And it says, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Well, you know who comes out of Abraham? You go over to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Look at Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is why Abraham and all this stuff is such, such a big deal. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. See that? The king of kings comes out of abraham and i will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and in, in their generations for an everlasting covenant see this covenant with abraham and israel it's everlasting that's why we we, we shouldn't go against israel it's an everlasting covenant 
Now, my main focus is on spiritual things. God's going to take care of Israel, that, that physical nation, and them getting the land. I don't have to put much thought into it. But at the same time, I'm not going to go against them. You see, there's a balance to it. Since I'm under the, I'm in the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom, my main focus is I'm just worried about getting people saved. I'm just hoping the Jews, many Jews as will, as their will get saved out there. But at the same time, I don't want to go against the physical nation of Israel because I know in the grand scheme of things, God's going back to dealing with the nation of Israel after the church leaves and he is going to restore them. He's going to restore the physical nation of Israel. But that's not my main focus right now. My main focus is I'm in a spiritual kingdom. I want to get as many people as I can saved. I want as many Jews that are out there to get saved. They're blind in part right now, but there's still some getting saved. you got to have a balanced view on it. Just like Paul says in Romans 11, he says, Concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sakes. See, the Jews don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't believe he's God. But as touching the election, they're beloved for the father's sakes. The fathers, as in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see that balanced view, the perfect balanced view the Apostle Paul had concerning the gospel, they're your enemies. Because they don't believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins and was buried and resurrected. But as touching the election, they're beloved for the father's sake. It's an everlasting covenant. Genesis 17, 7, everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. What do these guys not understand about everlasting? And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. So you see, he's commanding Abraham to circumcise them. Getting circumcised, you had to do it here. Now, you don't have to do it now. To be right with God, you don't have to be circumcised. But to be, for, to be a part of this Abrahamic covenant back then, you had to get circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So it was a serious thing. You had to get circumcised. And some smart guy wrote this about circumcision on the eighth day. I'm just going to tell it to you. I thought it was interesting. I'm not quite sure what it means exactly. But it says, he said, it's, it is, it's of significant medical importance that male circumcision be carried out on the eighth day after birth since the level of vitamin K is highest on this day. And vitamin K plays a pivotal role and regulation and control of the important clotting factors in the coagulation pathway that helps in stopping bleeding. I'm not sure what all that means, but it sounds like obviously God knows the human body because he made it, and he says eight today is when you need to get circumcised. I'm not sure when they circumcise kids now for the most part. I'm just throwing that in there. But in Genesis 21, you got the birth of Isaac, the true promised seed of Abraham. And he's 100 years old when he has Isaac. That's amazing. Genesis 22, you got Abraham going to sacrifice the promised son. You know what that shows you? The faith of Abraham. He believed the promise so much that he believed that if he sacrificed Isaac, God was just going to resurrect him because he believed that God was going to carry this thing out and he was going to be the father of many nations. Then you get to Genesis 26, and the Lord confirms the covenant again with Isaac. You get to Genesis 28, and the Lord confirms the covenant 
again with Jacob. You get to Genesis 29. Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. And Jacob goes on to have six sons and one daughter by Leah. With Leah, he, now this, is, this sounds like it's ins, insignificant and unimportant, but this will help you so much with your Bible. Jacob, which is the son of Isaac, which is the son of Abraham, so he's in this line of that promised seed here. Jacob has these sons with Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and a daughter named Dinah. You get over in Genesis 30, Rachel couldn't give Jacob any kids. So she has him go into her handmaid, Bilhah, to have a child with her. And she has Dan and Naphtali. Now keep listening. I'm, I'm going somewhere with it. When Leah realizes she isn't giving Jacob any more kids, she gives him Zilpah, her handmaid, to be his wife. And with Zilpah, he has Gad and Asher. And then Rachel finally has children, and, and she has Joseph and Benjamin with Jacob. But you count them sons up, and it's 12 sons. And these 12 sons make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And what do you hear about throughout the entire Bible? The 12 tribes. The 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And why is it called Israel? Well, you get to Genesis 32, and the Lord changes Jacob's name to Israel. And this is why the Jews are called the children of Israel. So you see, they're called Israel because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. They're called Hebrews because Abraham started the whole thing. He's the first Jew. He's Abram the Hebrew. And he's Abraham the Hebrew because he came from a guy named Heber. That's anti-Semitic to be against the Jews because Abraham, the first Jew, is in the line of Sem, S-E-M, which is also called Shem in the Old Testament. And they're eventually called Jews because Oh, way, down, way later in the book of uh, Second Kings, or First Kings, the kingdom splits under Rehoboam, and Rehoboam becomes the king of Judah. And they begin to be called Jews, short for Judah, you see? So you see, all these little, little things like that will help you so much. And this isn't, this isn't all I'm going to get into talking about the nation of Israel, but since I've, I'm, I'm kind of passing up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob here, I'm going to stop talking about them here. But if you, the key to understanding your Bible is rightly dividing Jews, Gentiles, and church. And we're going to get more into that later, but I'm going to go ahead and stop with it here.